Are you at Genesis chapter 9? Look what God says here in Genesis chapter 9 about human life. This is after the flood. Noah has come out of the ark, and God speaks to him. And this is what God says to him, beginning at verse 5, if you would please. God says, And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man, too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. God placed a special sacredness upon human life above all other forms of life. And then go with me to the book of Exodus. Now you're going to go past Genesis. The next book is Exodus chapter 21. I'm going to read a few verses, 12, 13, and 14. And then, uh, uh, actually I'm going to read 12 to 16. Then I'm going to jump down and I want to read verse 23. Now, so that you understand, I'm not taking this out of context. God is talking about all forms of human life surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his, la- in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now look, go on down with me, if you would please, to verse 23. Because God says something very special here. Actually, I'd like to begin at verse 22. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any man, excuse me, but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. God places a preciousness on the life in the womb as well. Psalm 39, 13 through 17, clarifies this even more. When the psalmist writing talked about life in the womb, he said, For you possessed my reins, you have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, in curiously wrought on the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eye did behold my substance, yet being imperfect. And in thy book were all my members written, which in continuous were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God holds precious all human life, born and unborn. And dear ones, if we are going to build an ark of safety for the family, we need to hold the principles of God's Word and live by them. When God commanded Noah to build the ark. He told him to build it from gopher wood. Now, we don't really know what gopher wood was. There's been speculation, but that's what it is. It's speculation. What we do know is that it existed pre-flood, and that it was extremely durable kind of wood because it could withstand the extreme pressures of the flood and survive thousands of years. It is visible to this day on Mount Ararat in Turkey. And so it must be an extremely durable kind of wood, although we really don't know what it compares to in 
uh, wood products today. God said, make it of gopher wood. Now, how is that relevant to us today in building an ark for the family? If we are going to build a family, build an ark for the family that is going to withstand the heavy seas of life and the storms that are certainly going to come against the family, we need to build it of substance that will be able to withstand the most severe storms that life can throw at it. And there's only one product to build it from. And Jesus talked about it. Would you go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, and this is where we're going to focus the rest of this morning. Matthew, chapter 7. Would you turn there with me, please? We're going to begin at verse 24. Holler amen when you get there. Okay, here we go. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Now Jesus is talking about building an ark for the family. And what is the substance that he says that the ark needs to be built from? The substance he talks about is his own word, the word of God. And if we're going to build an ark for the family, it requires a total commitment to believing that the Holy Bible is God's infallible word. It starts there. That is the corner from which everything else builds. Believing that the Holy Bible is truly God's infallible, inerrant, unchanging Word. And that no matter the culture, no matter the generation, no matter the nationality, God's Word is God's Word infallible, and we build our life on it. That is why the psalmist said these words. He said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it doth he meditate day and night. That man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaves doth not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. How many would like a life like that? Always fruitful, not withering, no matter how great the storms. And even if you get frost at the wrong time, it'll still bring fruit. Don't we all wish we had trees like that in Hermiston? Okay. But God says that's what your life can be like. It could be like that. Look at what he said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul said, and All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed, literally. All Scripture is God-breathed. Old and New Testament. It's God-breathed. Peter said it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, Holy men of old wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit 
And listen, and it's of no private interpretation. You don't get to put your own interpretation on it. The Scripture interprets itself. It tells you what it means, and it means what it tells you. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man and woman might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Hey, you want to live a good life? The Word of God. That's the answer. Because it will tell you how to live. I'm so glad the Word of God, time and again, has, has taught me and instructed me. And it doesn't just always tell me, you're really good. You're really good. You know what? You're really a good guy. You're really a good guy. There's been times it said to me, you know, you're being a jerk right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm the only one in the room that needs that sometimes. We have to be committed totally to the belief this is God's holy word and God has the right to tell me how to live and what is right and what is wrong. I was having a conversation with a college student one day and, and he, the person was arguing about right and wrong. And I said, hey, and, 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 of course, growing up in the last 30 years, he believed that, that right and wrong was relative. Well, well, whatever's right to you. I said, cool, I'd like to come shopping at your store. Because I'll give you a $10 bill and I want 20 back. Because to me, that's truth. He said, no, 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 no. I said, oh, what are you saying? Are you saying there are some things that are true, absolutely? And it doesn't matter what I may think about it, it's true? Isn't it funny how, how we want it to be relative when it comes to something we don't want to change, even if it's wrong? But when it's something you really believe in, that's got to be absolute. Have you ever noticed the people who want to tell you that mor morals are, are relative? They absolutely are relative. <laughs> Folks, there is a body of truth. A body of truth that you can totally commit your life to, and it's God's holy word. Amen? In a few weeks, we're going to come back, and we're going to study on why we know the Holy Scripture is God's infallible Word that we can trust. How do we know that and why? I can't wait to share with you some of the apologetics surrounding that and how you can take that Word and you can count on it. You can bank your life on its truth. Amen. But it's not enough just to believe that. The other part of it, we've got to obey. Did you notice... Both men building a house had the Word of God. How many noticed that? They both had the Word of God. So how come one guy's house was built on a rock and the other guy's house was built on the sand? What was the difference between the two guys? They both had God's Word. They both went to church. They heard it preached. They both went to Bible study. They heard it taught. They both read the Bible. What was the difference? One did it. The other didn't. And so it's not enough to just say in your family, we believe the Bible. We believe the Bible. Are you doing the Bible? Do you believe it and do it? And this is what James talked about. And I'd like to read you this passage from the NIV. If you'd like to turn there with me, it's the book of James, chapter 1. That's in the New Testament. You're going to go past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're going to go to the right. Keep going to the right. You'll go past Romans. You'll go past Corinthians. You'll go past Thessalonians. You'll go past Timothy. You'll go past Hebrews. And there's the book of James, chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading, if you'll join me, at verse 21. And we're going to read down through verse 25. 
James chapter 1, 21. Listen to how James said this. This is amazing. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth. Don't you wish? Don't, don't you sometimes feel like the media is just a cesspool? And it just splashed all over you. You just go, ah, I, I need a shower. Get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and then after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. You ever seen some people in Walmart and you think, that's what they must have done. <laughs> Because one thing is for certain, what they think they're looking like and what I'm seeing is not the same. There are believers like that too. See, God created all of us with blind spots, and He did not give us rearview mirrors. Our, those people that help us see our blind spots are our wives, our husbands, our children, our close friends, and the Word of God. So that we can see our blind spots. Why? He goes on to tell us. He says... He who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, Oh, we need to say that one more time. Not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it. Okay? How many know who we're talking about? Okay. He will be blessed in what he does. And so if we're going to build an ark for the family, so the family is going to be secure and weather the storms that's coming against the family right now in our culture. we got to start here. This has got to be the building material because no other building material is going to withstand the storms of life like the living Word of God will. Hallelujah. Amen? Go ahead. Give God a praise. Go ahead. Oh, but we, listen, we don't only have to do this. How many know our children need a model and they need a mentor? Did you hear what I just said? Our children need a model and a mentor. Now, can I, can I share with you a deep concern I have right now? And if you get mad at me, I guess you're just going to have to get mad at me, okay? But listen, this generation of parents are relying way too much on coaches and teachers to be the model and mentor. God gave them to you. Stop giving them away. Mom and dad, you be their model and their mentor. That's what they need. They need you. But we, we, we spend so much time running them to baseball, soccer, and all these other things, and they're spending hours with coaches and with teachers. So they're eight hours a day at school with teachers, and then after school, they're how many hours with coaches? 
mom and dad, when are you modeling and mentoring for them a godly life? I'm sorry, if, if, that, if that makes you angry, then would you do me a favor? Would you go pray about it? And I understand busyness. I understand long hours. Most of the years my kids were growing up, I was working 80 and 90 hour weeks, and 100 hours was not uncommon. But I want to tell you something. I was always there for dinner, and I made sure I had a minimum of three nights a week at home when I didn't answer the phone. That was back in the old days when you had a phone hooked up to a wall and it really did ring. <laughs> and I trained my kiddos how to answer the phone and I trained them how not to lie on the phone and say, oh, dad's not here when I really was there. I trained them how to answer the phone and how to say, you know, I'm sorry, he's not available right now. He'll return your call when he can. And the only, the only time it took me away, it had to be a death. Okay? Why? Because if I was so busy, I didn't have time to mentor my own children, and I lost my children, I'd lost everything. Children need a model and a mentor. And it's mom and dad they need. Well, but I'm a single parent. Then you've got a double duty there. And, you, and, and they need you desperately. Because I want to tell you something. We, we often say, oh, kids, they're so resilient. They'll bounce right back. And then it comes out at 20 and 30 and 40. Come on, we're kidding ourselves. Children get hurt inside at the same level adults do. And they don't just bounce back. They need to be healed. Are we okay? I'm giving you truth, dear ones, that will really strengthen your family. Look, the principles of God's Word has to be lived by the parents. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Hey, Dr. Phil and these guys may be fun to watch, but I want to tell you something. Don't walk by the counsel of the ungodly. Walk by the counsel of the Word of God. They don't stand in the way of the sinner. You're not going to learn much down at the bar, guys. You're not going to learn much about life down there. You might learn how not to live life down there. And I'm not saying give up your buddies. I'm just saying you have to have a body of truth that you know you can build your life on, and it builds on a rock. It will withstand the storms. Because we all go through storms. We are not promised a storm-free life. Bad stuff even happens to good people in this sinful, fallen world. And when it does, what are you building your life with? Are you building it with gopher wood or are you building it with balsa wood? Let's build it with solid stuff. Amen? Your children have to see you living it out. And it doesn't work this way. You're sitting there smoking a cigarette and said, don't you ever smoke. What? What? What are you saying? Do as I say, don't do as I do. What is that? Come on, they got to see it lived out. They got to see it modeled. They, there must be a systematic impartation of God's Word to your children, not hit and miss. It needs to be systemic. It needs to be a planned way. I like what Paul wrote to Timothy before he said, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The verses just before that, Paul said this. He said, I want to remind you of the Scriptures that you learned from an infant and that abide in you. 
Timothy's mother and grandmother poured into Timothy the word of God from his earliest days. A systematic way of teaching and training your children God's word. Do you have them memorizing God's word? Are you memorizing it with them? I shared with you last week that our, our oldest daughter for a long time thought that Psalm 23 was repeated twice. Because we would say it, and then she would say it, and we would say it, and then she would say it. And for a long time, when she quoted Psalm 23, she'd say, The Lord, the Lord, is our, is our shepherd, shepherd. I shall, I shall, not want, not want. <laughs> Cause, remember that? Because <laughs> we, from the earliest days, when our children began to speak, we began having them memorize the word. Why? To put in them the substance that builds a strong life that can withstand the storms of life without crumbling. But then we also had to give them a model of how to live it out. How do children know how to live it out if you don't help them grab the concepts? We wanted our daughters to learn the concept of dressing morally, not dressing in the immoral fashions of the world, and to love dressing morally. It's not just enough that they keep a list of rules. They have to love it, remember? And his delight is in the law of the Lord. We wanted them to delight in the Word of God, to delight in its principles and precepts, to love it. So one day we we took our girls to SeaTac Airport. And Wanda took one, and I took the other, and we kind of stood, and we stood, and here's what, here's what we want you to do. When a beautiful woman goes by that has a lot of cleavage showing and has a really short dress, watch the guy's eyes. Just watch their eyes. That's all I want you to do. Just watch the guy's eyes. And so we, we, and, and we, we were there for about an hour, and we did that, and then we took him to lunch. And we said, okay, so tell us what you saw. Both of them, zzz, their faces got really red and go, we can't talk. And I said, yeah, yeah, come on, what did you see? Oh, Dad, no, no, what did you see? What did you see? And we had them talk about it. And we said, so I got a question. Is that how you want men looking at you? No. Okay, now you're getting the concept Now, how then do you make sure men don't look at you that way? How do you draw attention to your face? Because the light of the soul is the eyes and the countenance. You want them looking at your face. How do you do that? And then Wanda began giving them tools to help know how. But if they don't understand the concept, how are they going to learn? And folks, we have a whole generation of young men and women today. They don't even understand the basic concepts of truth. And we as parents, we have to teach them. We have to model it. And we have to help them by training them how to make decisions based upon the Word of God. Come on, amen. This is building an ark. This is building an ark. And I got to tell you, this is why families are blowing apart today. It is because we have not built with solid material. We have built on sand. And it reminds me of the contractors back in the 1990s that tried to sue the state of Oregon because they had built a whole bunch of condominiums on the shore over Uh, on the coast, and they built the crazy things on sand. And, of course, we had, as we seem to have every winter, had one of those uh, storms that came through with 1,900-mile-an-hour winds, and it blew them all down, and they tried to sue the state of Oregon. I was reading that in the paper, and I went, all you got to do is read Matthew chapter 7, and you'll know, duh. (laughs) Dear ones, listen. 
We've got to really know how to do this. Let me just give you some tools of the trade. May I do that? Give you some tools of the trade. Go with me to the next slide, would you please? First of all, if we're going to really apply this on a regular basis, you have to commit yourself to reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating on the Word of God. You've got to be committed to this. It can't be casual. It can't be something you do when you have time. Sir, may I speak to you for just a moment? I know you're busy. I have often told people, Hermiston is the hardest working community I've ever lived in. And in our 43 years of ministry, we've lived in other rural communities. But I'm going to tell you something. I've never lived in a community that works as hard as this community works. And I know you do, sir. But can I tell you, working that hard, building a career, and building a bank account, and providing the cars, and providing the food, and providing the house, and, and the clothing, and stuff like that, you can do all that stuff, and your family blow apart. I, why am I getting the noise I'm getting in my mic today? I, am I doing something wrong? Okay, I don't want to be irritating when the sermon's as hard as this one is. Okay, here we go. We'll try to, I'll try to not make that noise again. Dear ones, listen. You not only need to work hard, sir, you've got to build your heart. And the way you build your heart is by the Word of God. And you have to set time to build the Word of God in your heart so that you're building a life so that you can speak to your children life to life. Back when Wanda and I were young, and we were still doing youth camps. We did youth camps for about 25 years, and we were still doing youth camps. One year, I was doing a dialogue time with the teenagers. I was just letting them ask me questions, and this one kid raised his hand, and he said, I want to ask you a question. What do you do when you have a dad who's always right and will never admit he's wrong? And, of course, those buzzwords always never stood out to me. And so just in a very soft voice, which is hard for me to do, but in a very soft voice, I said, you know, always and never, really, always and never. He said, I just yelled it, always, never. I said, are you exaggerating a little bit? He goes, listen, one time my dad said I was wrong, and I said to him, the Encyclopedia Britannica says it, and I went and got the book, I opened it, I showed him, and he looked me in the eye and said, the Encyclopedia is wrong. <laughs> I think the kid had a case. Dad, listen, when we're not building Christ-like character... When we're not building our life and we can speak life to life, our children will reject what we're saying. They got to see it lived in you. Mom, they got to see it lived in you. I know working and then coming home and, and taking care of the house and the dinner and the laundry, it can be crazy. But you must set aside time to build the Word of God in your life. This cannot be when you have time. This has to be priority of life. And not just reading it. Studying it. When you need an answer, do you know where to go? Do you know how to get it? When you're, you're, you're knowing, man, this is a major decision. What does God's Word say? I don't want to mess this one up. Do you know how to get it? It's really important. And then you've got to disciple your children to live it. So mom and dad, look. You've got a notebook. You've got pen and paper. You've got a regular place where you do this every day. And you're sitting there every day. You're studying. You're digging. You're learning. 
You're not just digging or reading the Bible, but you're studying, you're studying the lives of characters. Study the life of Joseph. Study the life of Moses. Study Esther. Study Ruth. Look at their lives. Look at their mistakes. Look at their successes. How did they recover from mistakes? How did they, when they messed up, how did they get back on track? Study their life. Learn. Study the Psalms. And Please read a proverb a day. There are 31 chapters, one for every day of the month. A proverb a day will help you keep the devil away. You will learn wisdom from pro- the book of Proverbs. But, this, but you, you, you got to disciple your children. You don't just raise them up. you got to disciple them. Some kids get yanked up. You got to disciple them. Some kids, they just swim through the maze and suddenly they're adults and they have no idea how they got there. You've got to disciple them. You've got to disciple them. You can't turn them over to Pastor Aaron and Fusion and say, Disciple my teenager. We can come along beside you and help you. You must disciple them. How do you do that? Let me give you one tool that will work. There needs to be at least one meal a day, the whole family's together. And it's not optional. At least one meal a day. Everybody's around the table. Every, everybody's, around, everybody's around the table. At least one meal every day. Everybody's around. I know we don't eat around the table today. We eat at McDonald's. We eat at Burgerville. We eat we eat pizza place. We I know I know I one meal a day. Everyone's together around the table, and you eat together and you talk about life. You talk about the kids. You talk about their friends. That is not a time for kids to be silent and to be seen and not heard. No, no, no. You want to hear from them. You want to hear what's going on, what's going on, what's happening with their children, with their friends. And then when everybody's done eating, you pull out the word and you read the Bible. And everybody brings their Bible to the table with them. And everybody takes out their Bible and opens it up, even the two-year-old. And then everybody reads the Bible together. And the children help read the verses. And if they're just learning to read, they can at least read the the, the a, and the can. And our kids started reading the Bible by reading about every second or third word of the verses because they couldn't read the big words. But they read the Bible. And we read the Bible together around the table. And then you discuss it. How does this apply to your friend that's in trouble over here? How does this apply to the fact that you got sent to the principal's office this week? How does this apply to the fact that you got in a fight on the playground? How does this apply? How does this apply to life? And you're discipling them. And between modeling it for them and teaching them in it and helping them to make biblical decisions, by the time they are teenagers, they should begin to make biblical decisions. And when they got a really big decision to make, you don't make it for them. You help them to apply the principles of God's Word so they are learning to make life decisions based upon the Word of God. We can do this. We can build an ark. Amen? Stand with me, would you please? We can build an ark. You can build an ark for that baby that's coming. You can build an ark for that new one that just arrived. You can build an ark for those teenagers. Now listen to me. Grandma and Grandpa, build an ark. Build an ark for those grandkids. We do not have to lose a generation. We do not have to have our marriages blowing apart. When the storms of life come and they beat against your house and they will. When you build it from the living word of God, it'll stand. 
It'll stand a lifetime. It'll stand a lifetime. And those of us in this room, and there are many of us, that have been married over 40 years, it's, we didn't get here by not going through storms. Some of us have gone through severe storms. Some of them health-related. Some of them relationship-related. But because we built our relationships, because we built our life on the Word of God, we're still standing. And so can you. So I got a question. You build on your life on the Word of God? You make in life decisions based on the principles of God's Word? You're building your relationships based on the principles of God's Word? Are you really building your relationships on the principles of God's Word? Really? Building your family on the principles of God's Word? Is that how you're doing it? If not, why not? Why not? And when are you going to start building it on God's Word? You've got to understand, dear ones, you're either building on sand or you're building on a rock. And it's either going to stand the storms or it's going to crumble. At some point it will crumble. Or you can build it on that rock. You can build it with the gopher wood of God's holy Word. And you can know it will stand no matter how severe the storm comes. And it is time to make that decision. So I'm going to ask you today to make a commitment that has three parts to it. It's a threefold commitment. Look at it with me. Lord Jesus Christ, I will love you and live for you with all my heart. Part number one. Part number two. I will study your word and learn your principles for living. And then part number three. Here we go. I will make my decisions and build my relationships in obedience to your word. Are you ready to make that level of a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ today? If you would say yes, I'm going to ask you to step out from where you are and stand down here with me. I'm ready to do this, Pastor. That's how I want to live my life. I want to live committed to Jesus Christ. I want to learn the principles of his word. I want to make my decisions and I want to build my relationships in obedience to his word. That's how I want to live my life. If you say, that's me, I want to do that, meet me down here right now. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. Come with a prayerful heart. We're going to pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Dear ones, I know I preached hard today. Because I, I am fighting for some lives here today. I know I am. I'm fighting for some lives here today. Because there are some lives that are just about ready to blow apart. And it's time to pull it together with God's word. You can do this. You go, oh, we got so far to go. Listen, you can remodel. You can remodel. You can, you can take off the wall covers and you can remodel. You can get the framework in God's Word. Listen, you really can. It's not too late. Don't let it blow apart. I'm going to wait a moment longer because there's some others that need to step out. You need to make this commitment today. you got to start with this first one. you got to give it all to Jesus. you got to give it all to Jesus. All to Jesus. I surrender. All to Him I freely give. Come on, give it all to Him. Give it all to Him. I'm going to wait just one moment longer for another person to step out and come. Another couple going to come. They're going to build their family on Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we are standing here today and we are saying to You, our whole life for the rest of our life. Given to you. Our whole life for the rest of our life. All, all given to you, Jesus. You be 
Master, you be the one in charge. Take our life, Lord Jesus. Jesus.